sometimes when we tell someone something, we don't want them to help us analyze it or give us a solution. Like, because sometimes the healing comes in, you know, in just being hurt, you know? Welcome to the Sustainable Living Podcast. Tips, tools, and tactics for living a heart-centered life that honors Mother Earth and our inhabitants. The information shared on the Sustainable Living Podcast reflects the opinions of host Marion West, Janice Fryant, and their guests. Please use your own discretion and research before applying any information to your individual situation. Now, here are your hosts, Marion and Janice. Today's guest is Amy Ostreicher. To tell you the truth, we talked quite a while ago, and I was holding on to the interview, trying to find the perfect time to release it. When I contacted her, I had known her story from a TED Talk she did, and I was so impressed with her resilience overcoming this incredible occurrence in her life where her stomach basically exploded, something most of us would not have survived. I thought we were mostly going to talk about tools and tactics to deal with pain and to deal with being different. And instead, we dove into so many different subjects like being sexually abused, being a survivor of the Nazi Auschwitz camp and more. And I was just not clear when would be the right time to bring this episode to you. And I think right now is the right time. It is touching on so many issues which are in the news in one way or another, be it how to get along as people, be it how to deal with adversity. And without further ado, I'm giving you our conversation. Actually, <laughs> one more thing. This was on a, a telephone, on a cell phone, on Amy's side, so the sound quality is not that great. But I think the content is so important. I hope you enjoy. Hello, everyone. This is Marianne with the Sustainable Living Podcast. And I'm here with Amy Oestreicher. And Amy has an incredible story to tell. She endured some very, very serious health issues. And I think she has lots to share with us on how to overcome difficulties in your life. So welcome, Amy. Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> I'm so excited to that you are able to come on the podcast and to meet you at least via telephone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to share really quick that I had heard Amy's story on a different podcast and the very next day we somehow oh, wow. <laughs> connected via Facebook and Amy said, oh, I want to come on to your show. And I was oh, that's so, so funny. excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. That's You're welcome. <laughs> so, Amy, would you mind telling your story? Yeah, um, definitely. Um, so, you know, like I grew up kind of a musical theater driven kid that that was what I wanted to do. And I was always creative from the time I was born. Um, that was really um, my identity. Uh, and so that kind of steered me through my entire life as a kid. Um, when I was 15, I had a voice teacher who I really respected and he looked up to and became my mentor. And when I was 17, you know, he started molesting me all of a sudden, which really, you know, put me in a state of shock. And, you know, I just, my reaction was, I left my body and I don't even remember anything that happened. And I just became very numb and, um, you know, all this inspiration that I once felt as a kid, um, you know, like nature and art and all the beauty around me, um, you know, everything just felt numb and just compulsive to the point where, you know, I thought there was something wrong with me. Like I didn't understand that someone else could drain, you know, your mind like that. And so 
I didn't realize also that this would also manifest in a lot of anxiety and and I still couldn't really process what was going on until I finally realized um, that I had been sexually abused by finding a book actually, The Courage to Heal, um, that I just happened to find because I was just instinctively kind of looking for self-help books. And I happened to flip over into the page of symptoms and I remember I just happened to open it and read the symptoms, which were, you know, I feel out of body, I feel numb, I don't trust myself anymore. Um, And I realized just in those symptoms that, wow, like I was sexually abused. And that really (laughs) was a realization for me that became like I was carrying this really huge secret that I didn't know what to do with. Um, And then I finally told my mother the April of my senior year, and we were going to get therapy and all those kind of things. And then two weeks later, I just had a really bad stomachache that it just wouldn't go away. And um, my father took me to the emergency room for an x-ray, and the pain just got really, really bad. Um, And I guess my cheeks just, like, puffed up on the way there because um, I had gone septic. And the fluid, um, if I had gotten there a moment later, would have gone to all of my internal organs and I would have died. And, um, you know, obviously this is me just recounting stories I've heard, but um, apparently when the surgeon cut into my stomach, literally hit the ceiling of the operating room because there was so much internal pressure. And so I was in a coma for months and I woke up and, you know, I had just been in high school. I literally just gotten my college acceptance letters and the doctor told me eventually that I didn't have a stomach anymore and I couldn't eat or drink and they didn't know if I'd ever be able to again. And so that was really waking up to a total state of another shock, like where, where the heck did my life go? Um, so it was definitely dealing with a lot of uncertainty that was really unfamiliar to me as a teenager. Um, so I was discharged from the hospital months later um, because medically now I was stable. You know, they had uh, cleared up all the infections and I wasn't going to die now. It's just the only thing was that I didn't have a digestive system. So I was basically asked to leave the hospital, um, you know, sustained on IVs for food and drink. And no one could tell me if I'd ever even be able to finally see myself again. Um, So I was really let into the real world with other people, like normally eating and drinking, really just forced to take it one day at a time because I didn't really have a choice. Um, If I thought about how long it would be, I think I would have gone crazy. Um, So I really coped through creativity and um, just doing things because I think I remember waking up from a coma and thinking, you know, I don't want to be a has-been at 18. You know, I'd always been so driven my entire life to create and I couldn't imagine myself just kind of lying in a bed and for the rest of my life. So I think that kind of filled me with this like manic drive to just, you know, whatever it is, I got to create something. I got to write something because it felt like at that point, like how else am I going to document this or even like prove I exist? Um, So I really did have to take it one day at a time. And thankfully I did because it turned into um, six of the past 10 years um, and 27 surgeries uh, before I could eat or drink again, which if I had known then, I think I would have just said, you know, what? I'm not going to even attempt this. Um, and there were a lot of setbacks along the way. Um, you know, I was supposed to eat and drink again uh, three years later rather than six. And this was a huge uh, 19 hour surgery and it worked for a bit and then I went to California and my wound actually just burst open and I had to be air vac back to Yale Medical Center um, for emergency surgery and that was really traumatizing because you know I thought my story had been kind of wrapped up and and I was done and this was going to be you know my new life but you know I reason why I talk about detours so much and 
and, you know, eventually them being beautiful detours is that was a huge discovery for me because I was stuck in Yale for months and I was so mad, you know, this was everything I hoped for now ruined. And my mom started bringing like cheap art kits to the hospital and I'd always been creative, but I never really was a visual artist, but because I just had nothing left to do, I mean, no, nothing to do with this frustration, mainly, um, I picked up a paintbrush for the first time and my world just, you know, changed. It was the first way I could find because I really didn't have the words to express what I was feeling. You know, I just felt it inside. Um, but this was the first way I really could find a healthy way to express it where it wasn't like ruining my life or running my life. Um, but, but I was still with it. And that was a really powerful tool to get through the rest of the setbacks that happened. And it was a way that I could, for the first time, really express my emotions to other people because, you know, I kept all these emotions locked up, you know, not even able to communicate them and it wasn't doing me any good. Um, so eventually, um, that all of that art was enough to kind of get me to realize my own story. And I was able to go back through the thousands of you know, journal entries I had written over the years. And I actually put together a one woman musical about my life, um, gutless and grateful. Um, and this was a big deal for me because, you know, I, my story had been covered in the news, but I had never really kind of spoken about it myself. And I really experienced like, you know, the healing benefit of being able to speak, you know, what has happened to you um, because I just did it all for total strangers and it was a huge risk. You know, I never even talked about it. I was talking about even the sexual abuse and everything. Um, but what I didn't realize was for the first time, like I saw that people could relate to my story. So it wasn't just that, oh, the girl that stomach exploded, is she okay? It was, wow, like people could empathize with the frustration and the anger and the uncertainty. And I didn't feel like such a freak anymore. And I think that's when I really did start to heal. Um, so then, again, I thought that that was my story and I was all good. Um, but then the week after, I did have my 27th surgery, um, which was supposed to really fix everything. And it turned into just a huge, huge disaster um, that I'm still recuperating from, to be honest, five years later, um, which was really frustrating because now, like, a week before, I just, like, sung about all this stuff. And now I was back in the hospital, back in the same position that I was just singing about. Um, so I had really reached my lowest point. Um, and that's when I actually decided to um, take Gutless and Grateful and turn it into like a mental health and sexual assault uh, prevention program that, you know, not only do I do it to for theaters and things, but I do it, you know, to colleges and organizations and, and conferences where I do the show. And I talk about, you know, what happens, you know, what is like the psychological impact of trauma? You know, what happens when we don't feel free to express what we're feeling and also, what's like the amazing amount of growth that happens when we finally do share our story. Uh, and that's kind of the cliff notes of everything. But yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's like so much I can't even imagine. So uh, our connection is a little bit bad. So I'm going to recap uh, something from the beginning because then I'm not sure if everybody can hear it very clearly. But yeah, it, sure. Yeah, so and and correct me if I say anything which is, you know, incorrect. So you were 18 yeah. when you a discovered that you had been a victim of sexual abuse and then just a few weeks yeah. after that you developed this incredible stomach ache and luckily your dad yeah. took you to the hospital where your stomach yeah, very lucky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm, I was thinking about it, said if you wouldn't have been at the hospital, you probably wouldn't have survived. So your well, stomach... there's no doubt that um, that my dad definitely saved my life because he's also a doctor too. So, you know, 
he had connections. Like, I guess even, you know, I find out bits of these stories as I go, but I guess he had already alerted a doctor to be like ready. I guess he, you know, was worried what could have happened, but I definitely would not be here without my dad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so he might have recognized, or he probably did recognize yeah. that this was far beyond a normal stomach ache. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm very happy that you survived this. And so 10 years... Me too. <laughs> You're welcome. 10 years of 27 surgeries. I cannot even imagine. So... Yeah. <laughs> uh, you... you put so much into this um, short <laughs> recap of your last 10 years, said um, it's almost difficult to, to begin where to ask questions. But I wanted to first go to the surgeries and the pain. I think, well, one key thing you said, you didn't know in the beginning how long the journey would be. And that was probably a good thing, right? Oh, yeah. But you know what? I think we can think that for everything. I mean, an example is right now, like that last surgery was such a disaster. And that was five years ago. And so I still have this wound that hasn't healed that makes life like miserable right now. And it's like we're still like actively looking for answers. And I've held on this far. And who knows how long it is till we find an answer. But I'm not going to give up. But I also don't want to know. You know how much longer it's going to be. Right. You take, so maybe that's ex already one key tip you can have for people. Say, yeah, to you take, have to say you don't have a choice. Yeah. You, know, you got to take it one day at a time. One day at a time. <laughs> Otherwise, it's so crazy. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So one of the ways you, you dealt with, it sounds like a lot with your emotional pain was the art therapy. Did you find any yeah. specific tools which helped you with the physical pain during the recovery periods? You know what? Physical pain is physical pain. And unfortunately, you know, I'm a, not a doctor, so I don't have magic cures. But, um, you know, I can say that, you know, there is something to be said when your mind's in a healthy place, too, because, you know, stress, anxiety, that all, you know, manifest in some kind of pain um i know you know when i kept you know way back when i did keep that secret in of being sexually abused like i felt this just like fire in my chest that just does not feel good so whatever physical symptoms we're feeling already it certainly compounds things you know mm -hmm. yeah definitely so back to some logistics so you weren't able to eat for six years Right. Yeah. And how did you deal mm -hmm. with that? In it, it sounds like you had a very supportive family. Yes. I mean, there's no magic answer. Mm -hmm. Again, like sometimes I look at that. I'm like, how the heck did I do that? But that also gives me a bunch of gratitude. Like I still have those moments where like I'm taking like a chug of water. And like I remember exactly what it was like, you know, to look at people like in the sun with like the, you know, the drops condensating on the you know front of the water bottle and like just imagining what that would feel like you know like I still remember how obsessed I was with water mm -hmm. you know sometimes like even I can't imagine it like you know yeah did did your family and you find like a different routine to replace mealtime to because that seems like a lot of times that food is well that was that was like a huge thing I'm actually writing a new show about that like what do you do like meals are holidays all that you know such mm -hmm. a big part of everything so what do you do and you know to cope you know, again I tried to like streamline my story so I wasn't talking for two hours <laughs> but um <laughs> You know, I first got home in the hospital, it was, like, dangerous to feel because if I felt anything, it might make me hungry because, you know, hunger is also, like, an emotional reaction, too. So I would just lock myself in my room all day, and, you know, I would even just shut the blinds. It was, like, totally dark just to have, like, no outside stimulation, you know, because, like, if I felt, like, you know, who knows? And I would just spend the entire day, like, typing typing and journaling you know I was so determined and as a result like I have thousands and thousands of really beautiful passages that I don't know you know how I even had the focus to concentrate but it's all making 
great material for my book that's coming out, which is good. Um, but, um, but yeah, you know, I really had to isolate myself for a really long time, you know, because you're right, like, meal time is kind of how you break up your day. Right. And it also seems to be the time where you gather as a family. So yes. And, and so we didn't have that. Did you guys create a different ritual or it just didn't happen? You know, I have three Vincent. older brothers who were kind of out of the house because they're much older. And so, you know, my dad was at work and, you know, he came home and would just go right to helping me with like my medical routine. And, you know, my mom was kind of, you know, there as as my anchor, sort of just there. And I, I really just kind of took it one day at a time. You know, and and eventually, like, mm-hmm. I did, yeah, actually, not eventually, a month out of the hospital, I auditioned for a local musical, and I got the lead. Um, and, you know, I started a chocolate business because I was so hungry, and I just wanted to... A chocolate to- business when you can't eat? <laughs> That's... I, you know what? I was so hungry, and I wanted to just play with candy. And, I mean, there are a million things I did during this time that, again, I'm like... You can go to my site to find out about, but if I told you everything, it would be like five a, hours. A marathon so. interview. But, <laughs> but you know, I was never the kind of person that like lying in bed. And, you know, even in the hospital, I didn't like lying in bed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so like, I always had to be doing something, and that was kind of how I coped. Yeah, that makes complete sense. I think if you just sit yeah. and think <laughs> about being miserable, you get more and more and more miserable. Yeah, and you'll get depressed. Yeah. Not doing it. I would, you know. For sure. So, yeah. <laughs> so would you uh, tell us more about your one-woman show and the one you're writing right now? Is that a one-woman show as oh, well? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, I'm actually doing, you know, a few projects, okay. actually. But, um, yeah, I, I didn't expect to go. I'm grateful to, you know, that really just started because I missed singing and I saw how therapeutic it was to get back to doing what I love. And I was like, I want to put together like a cabaret after song. And then I was like, oh, all these journal entries, I can like use these for stories in between. And, you know, slowly it became more and more theatrical. Um, and it's basically the story of my life um, from like being a teenager um, all through everything. And it's actually a musical comedy because that's how I got through, through humor. Mm. And I premiered it in New York in 2012, and I've done it all over the place, which is really exciting. I'm, you know, I'm this year's. I'm excited because I'm doing a bunch of you know big theaters in New York, which I've loved for a long time. And also, you know, I've been taking it to. You know, I took it to um, a surgeons conference. I've done it for nurses. I've done it for college students all over, which is really amazing. Especially, you know, sexual assault is such a huge issue right now For so sure. I really do talk about you know post-traumatic stress disorder and you know how I froze in trauma and how campuses can work to prevent it so I've been doing a lot of that you know I'm going to Arizona this year because I'll be the keynote speaker for Take Back the Night which I'm really excited about um so the show has been a way to really branch out in even more directions you know it's led to speaking it's led to workshops it's led to conferences all over um so i'm really grateful for that um and then just this year which is super exciting it started with a college student reaching out to me saying that she saw my video clips online could she perform my show and at first i'm like what and then i'm like oh my you know it's such an honor um so actually next month i'm flying out to uh, minnesota um, to see she's the president of the drama club, and she's very active in like the sexual assault community, and she's really excited to perform it. And I've actually had a few students reach out to me to perform excerpts of monologues and songs. Um, so, I mean, that's great. I mean, because the truth is, it's not just my story. You know, it's a story of anyone that's been through something they didn't expect and really had to use inner resources to cope. So I think that's the biggest honor of all. Um, And in terms of new stuff, um, I'm working on another solo piece. Um, With you, my grandmother was a Holocaust survivor and I feel very close to her. Um, And I'm really, you know, Gullison Grateful doesn't go into the sexual abuse as much as, you know, I wanted to share at that time because I think 
at the time I wasn't really ready, but I think the more I performed it, the more I want to share about that. So, you know, there's a lot of different themes going into this piece. Um, I also have written a ton of original songs that I wanted to incorporate and the movement. So I'm hoping that it's very um, multi-media. Um, and then um, the last thing um, for now is um, I've actually um, finished a full-length drama um, based on my family in the ICU, which is based off of a journal that one of my brothers kept while I was in a coma. Um, and it's, you know, very hard to read material, but it's also really uplifting because you see how a family kind of copes and comes together in the hardest of times. So um, I had a, a few readings last year and um, I'm going to try to produce it this year. I'll probably reactivate my Patreon because putting up a show takes funding for sure. Um, yeah. But, so um, I'm, I'm really excited about that because, you know, I do all these interviews and things, but like, you know, my family really um, was there. So I want to get their voices out there. And then my book will be out. So um, lots of fun stuff. Yeah, you have been keeping very, very busy. And this is it's the first time, obviously, I hear about you writing about your family. And yeah, I really like that because I think there are so many people in that situation where you want to help the person who is being sick, but you don't know how to or what to. And you know, what? yeah, they, you need a lot of emotional support as well, right? It's funny about that. I was just giving a presentation for a huge um, conference of nurses in New Jersey. And, you know, nurses are like the most compassionate, you know, like big moms, you know, they just want to help. And I was talking about, you know, patient nurse collaboration, and how to be, you know, empathetic and, and all of that. And it was so funny. Like, it was like, I just had given them like a magic, like answer, but they were all so, you know, shocked. And I'm like, the best thing you can do when a patient is telling you that what they're fighting about or what they're angry or anything negative, you know, sometimes we only tell those things because we don't want someone to fix it. We just want someone to listen. You and know, nurses are such like caretaking people that of course, you know, like mothers, they want to, you know, they feel helpless because they can't like fix anything immediately. And then when I was like, you know, sometimes they just want someone to say like, I hear you, like, thank you for sharing that. And they were all like, oh my God, that's amazing. But it's true. You know, sometimes when we tell someone something, we don't want them to help us analyze it or give us a solution. Like, because sometimes the healing comes in, you know, in just being hurt, you know? Right, right. Yeah, I think that's definitely some a lot of women feel that when we speak, we don't necessarily want to hear to fix it, but to just be able to say it for sure. Right, and and the saying it is a big act of courage. And sometimes, listen, you know, for me, it took me ten years, and it wasn't just all of a sudden. Like I said, you know, it came first through art, then through music, and then eventually. I found the words, but you know, it takes time. It definitely takes time. For sure. Are you still pursuing your visual art career as well? Yes. Um, unfortunately, I only have two hands. Um, so I have to, the truth is like both things take equally amount, you know, amount of work to perform in the art. So like, you know, I switch based on where the energy is like, like a year ago, I was, you know, my show was on the back burner pretty much. And I was just doing art. Like I had my sh art in six galleries. I was creating, I was blogging every day about it. And, you know, you, I guess you just go where the energy goes. You know, right now my show is really taking off. And I'm hoping in this new piece that I do, which is going to tell like a lot of moments that, you know, were very poignant to me. I'm imagining myself like painting on stage and, you know, hopefully a way to bring all this together. Mm -hmm. That sounds really interesting. Yeah. You said you're also working actively with victims of sexual abuse. Yeah. Would you elaborate on that, please? Yeah, you know, again, it started with my show and, and me just doing a talk back after the show about what it was like. And then the more I got into that community, the more I realized how much really has to be done in educating people like about the psychological impact of that and what post-traumatic stress disorder is um, because I think one of the 
biggest hindrances is like this barrier to talking about it is this stigma around it or, you know, victim blaming or like I should have done something different, which I felt for a really long time because I was 17. Like I wasn't a kid. Mm -hmm. So before I understood that, like, you know, an individual can just like freeze like a deer in the headlights when traumatized. I, you know, I obviously just like blame myself. Um, And if I was feeling that way, then I knew a lot of other people were feeling that way as well. So I think that education about what actually goes on in trauma, you know, I learned that like the physiological sensations of of helplessness um, are, are the same as, you know, guilt and shame. So if your body feels helpless in a situation, you're going to feel this shame as well. Um, a big, um, you know, uh, book that changed my life was Waking the Tiger by Peter Levine, who um, started this thing called somatic experiencing. And his thing is that trauma, you know, is something that we can't think ourselves out of through talk therapy. You know, when we're shocked like that, all those sensations are really locked in our bodies. And we heal through, you know, taking that same energy that gets stuck and finding creative ways to discharge it um and for me you know, i witnessed that firsthand that was why the art and the singing and doing what i loved was so healing for me even if it wasn't directly about terrible things you know it was a way of taking that energy that got kind of shut down at the moment of impact and and discharging it um so i've been doing a lot of work it was actually uh, just a finalist for a, a huge five thousand dollar grant um, from the National uh, Sexual Assault Education Conference, which is a big honor. And it also is listed now under the directory for uh, the National Initiative for um, Arts and Health in the Military, which is very cool. So it's really rewarding to be able to do that. Uh, to me, this is such a big field we have been quiet about for such a long time. And it's. Uh, yeah, now it's finally coming out. Yeah. And but the blaming the victims is still very big and no, it's like an I don't want to say natural thing, but but even a therapist asked once, like, oh, were you in love with your voice teacher? <laughs> you know, because I was seventeen. Um, for a while, I was like, oh my god, was I? Maybe he's right. Um, it it really takes an education because I know for me, it made like things come together. <clears throat> when I realized it w- that all of this trauma, all it is is just energy. And the problem is that energy just goes to places that we don't have a control over. And that's why we lose our sense of self. You know, that's why we forget how to make decisions. And when we're not, like, confident in who we are anymore, of course we're going to be influenced by feeling guilty or not, you know, or hating ourselves or destructive coping mechanisms. So really, the secret is, you know, acknowledging that that all of that anxiety and shame, all that is, is energy. And if you feel that energy, then theoretically, you can use that energy for something else. That for me, that's as simple as it became. Not simple, but that's what it became. That's a very beautiful way to put it. Because then we can take power back in saying, you know, we, <laughs> exactly. we can direct that energy and do some with it. Right. It's not, it's not like this trauma is this outside force that did something to us. This energy is within us. So that means the positive changes can come from an inside source as well. Mm-hmm. Very beautiful. Thank you for that. I wanted to ask you the place. Are, do you usually have a female audience or is it a mixed audience? Oh, you know, it's always mixed. That's it. I've never been asked that before. <laughs> um, no, it's always mixed, which is nice. Yeah, because, you know, I feel like there's maybe a lot of work with women and women working for women so and so forth, but the education really needs to go to the male population as well. Well, that's something I'm actually hoping to get more into, too, because, um, you know, it was hard enough for me to start talking about it, but I can't imagine you in this culture, too. You know, I've known a few male survivors personally, and I always feel like it's so hard for them. And you know, there are some great organizations coming forward, like um, One in Six and Men Can Stop Race. And, 
things like that. But I really, I really hope, you know, their voices get amplified too. Yeah. I, I feel there needs to be so much education going on in that field oh, for, yeah. for everybody, really. I agree. Yeah, I agree. To ensure safety for everybody. Would you tell me a little bit more about your book? Yeah. Um, well, my TED Talk I gave last year it was all about detours in life, understandably. Um, and so that's kind of the idea of this book. It's a book about my life, but I've already talked about my life a ton. Like, this is definitely a lot more than that. Um, it's going to, like, all of those thousands of journal entries I did, you know, to cope. And really, you know, it's easy to say, like, I coped by, you know, creativity and resources. But this is really the ins and outs of, like, what was it like every day? And then, you know, how all this detour played out and, and also um, kind of the tools that helped me that I feel like can help a lot of other people too. Yeah, yeah I'm going to read it. <laughs> My poor editor, he had no idea what he was getting himself into. Um, you know, like every one of the 15 chapters started as like 500 pages. I mean, he's enjoying it. He's like the best guy ever, but he is so tolerant. He's like a perfect counterpart to me because like I give him all this, like all this material. I'm like, Tom, like, how about this? How about this? And he's like very methodical. And I would lose patience with myself already because there's just so much. We, we, we've already decided there's going to have to be three books out of this. Um, so, so really the, the work was all done like two years ago. Now it's just this damn editing. <laughs> Yeah, that's a huge part. But yep. editing is so important too. Oh, yeah. I mean, I know a lot of <laughs> writers and for sure that's a big part and that's what in yep. the end probably makes it very successful mm -hmm. too. I wanted to come back to your grandma a little bit. Yeah. So your would you talk about the play and what you're addressing and yeah, just tell us more. Yeah, well, actually, you know, my grandma was an amazing woman. And aside from everything I mentioned, I'm also working on a short play now about the Lower East Side um, and kind of her legacy there. Um, because, you know, she survived Auschwitz at 18. And she survived, actually, because she was an amazing seamstress. Um, and the Nazis actually forced her to sew their uniforms. Um, so, you know, she had a lot of stories that, you know, she... I don't think she felt comfortable sharing until like the very last years of her life. Um, but she, she was always a big part of her family. Um, her and my grandfather, um, who like hid in Siberia. Um, and so they met on the Lower East Side and um, they ended up starting one of the biggest uh, sewing corporations in the garment district um, and became really successful tailors. Um, and so like sewing has always been like a big part of our kind of legacy and and you know she had eight brothers and sisters um all of them but one survived but the miraculous thing is that they all were able to come back to come to New York on the same boat and all kind of find each other somehow um and I you know whoever is living I was able to take hours and hours of oral history with them last summer and I mean, it was so funny because, you know, every family member starts by like, oh, I don't know anything, you know, but the more you talk to me, you jog your memory. And what was nice was everyone remembered like a little bit. And so by like interviewing all these people, I was able to string together a lot um, and find out really beautiful things. And so I'm planning on using those in, in this with the idea of, you know, trust, like, what makes us keep trusting and keep fighting, you know, when we're constantly, you know, our hope is constantly shattered? Um, and, and, you know, how is resilience learned? Is it taught? Is it inherited? Um, and it's kind of combining my story with all those ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Both of those things required a lot of resilience, for sure. It's, you know, this mm -hmm. is very close yeah. to my heart, too, because I grew up in Germany and way after the war. Oh, okay. And that whole history was never really talked about. You know, it, it was just right, for my right. generation, it was given as a huge guilt complex, you know. And when I first came to America, I thought, oh, everybody Jewish must hate me, you know, just because I'm German and, 
you know, this is not the case. I have a lot of Jewish friends, but it's it's very much yeah, yeah. a you know a history where I wish people yeah. would learn from and prevent things to happen like that again in the world. You know. Yeah, you know that's so interesting because uh, you know I've done a lot of research on like trans transgenerational trauma um, and like the differences between the impact on the second generation of survivors and the third. Right. And it's really interesting, but you know I haven't really uh, you know learned or you know thought much about you know, the um, inheritance of the trauma, you know, for the Germans that I'm sure, you know, inherited this kind of burden of, you know, and a lot of people over there, you know, they were brainwashed as well. So, you know, it's it's very interesting how we, how we carry those things and how important it is to start talking about them because um, then we realize that we're not alone in that. And I think that's how we heal from anything. For sure. And to realize we are all human beings. And, you know, if we exactly. come together and honor each other in that, we can create a world we want to live in, you know. Right. You know, because if you look around what's happening today, you know, history unfortunately repeats itself. But still we have that, you know, same capacity for good. Um, and, and you see movements of that. And hopefully one day, you know, those voices will, you know, maybe through the wonders of technology, making everything smaller, you know, but, you know, those voices will come together. <laughs> that's truly my hope. I think that's part of why we want to do this or why we are doing said podcast is to give yeah, well, a platform, great. you know, for voices of we want a different reality. And I really, really honor you for doing so much out in the world to help people and really having taken your personal tragedy and turned it into such a strong um, lesson for anybody, really. So thank you so much thank for you. that. Thank you. That means a lot. That means a lot. Yeah, I'm completely amazed by you. So. <laughs> uh, where, huh? One day maybe we'll meet up. Maybe I'll take my show. Hey, I book my show myself. So if you know any places near there, or if anyone listening does, I that's how it all happens. I reach out. So um, yeah. <laughs> yes. So, but that's a good platform to know. So, what what do people need? What do you need to come to a place to perform your show? I mean, honestly, I've done it for auditoriums of 800 people. I've done it for a classroom of 15 people. So, you know, because it's just me. Um, so really just, um, you know, go to my site, send me a note, or find some way to contact me. And I, you know, I've adapted it to everything. I've, um, you know, I'm, I'm doing a, a conference in New York next month, uh, the Jewish Orthodox um, Feminist Alliance. And I'm mostly talking about how hope builds resilience and, and then I'm doing some excerpts of it. So, you know, we can mix and match. Sometimes I need workshops about it. So, yeah, just just get in touch with me and and I'll tell you some stuff. Um, my Sounds... website is, um, yeah, my website is amyoes.com. And that's also my Twitter handle. I'm like way too active on Twitter because it's just so darn easy. I know it's I easy. Oh, yeah. It's <laughs> and terrible. We're going to link to all of that on our website awesome, as well. Awesome. So you can find Amy really easy. Amy, is there cool. something you would like to share with our audience we haven't touched on yet? Uh, I think we overwhelmed them for now. <laughs> no, but about, you know, the detour thing, you know, you can also see on my TEDx video on my site, or I'm sure you can look it up. Um, it's just um, amyoes.com slash TEDx, and you'll learn, you know, why I call myself a detourist. And this detourist thing is, um, you know, a whole kind of online community and movement I'm trying to start. Um, if you look up, like, on any social media, uh, hashtag love my detour. Um, it's all about getting people to love whatever path they're taking. If they don't love it now, just you know, holding in there. Um, and um, actually once a week, I have a feature where anyone can write in about a detour in their life. Um, that's the only requirement. You don't even have to find the meaning of it. You just uh, say what your detour was, write a little, you know, piece about it and where you are today. And um, what's so nice is I've been doing this for over a year. I have over a hundred stories 
And it's so beautiful because you see these stories that you know, are really terrible traumas and illness and divorces. And, but then you also have the detour stories that are just like, oh, you know, um, I just happened to, you know, walk into this store and buy this book and it changed my life. Or, you know, I had this one guy who um, was a doctor in Japan who just decided he wanted to move to Hawaii and become a surfer. Um, one person just moved to an island to set up a, a clothing store. So, you know, because that's the whole message that I want to hit home the most, that it's not, you know, having a detour or a story isn't about how extreme it is. You know, just because what happened to me is kind of crazy, that doesn't mean that, you know, anyone else is not capable of using those same resources. So, so really, you know, if you have any detour, don't like hear my story and be like, oh my God, I shouldn't submit mine. You know, it's really any, any change in life that you didn't expect and then what came from it. So um, I have guidelines and stuff. So just uh, send me a note. Yeah, that sounds really cool. And we're going to link to it too. And I'm going to write some of my detours in yes, it. Please, please, please. <laughs> do, do. Lots of souls in my yeah, life, I mean, for sure. Story, I never expected, listen, you know, it started like, you know, having guest posts because I was going away or something. I never expected to have such a beautiful collection. I mean, these stories are just amazing and it really shows that sometimes it just takes one story to get everyone started and then you know people are realizing things as they write um you know i'm thinking eventually i would love to put together some kind of compilation and some kind of like you know chicken soup for the soul book to get these out there because you know it's really an honor to have people share their story with you and they're really you know even if people just want to read the stories so far on my site, it's really um, wonderful. Sounds great. I'm definitely going to look for it. Yeah, cool. Anything else you would like to say why we have such chance? No, the other thing is, um, you know, when they finally hooked up my digestive system, uh, you know, they made like a little pouch out of like whatever intestine I have left. So I can eat, you know, a ton, but like I only absorb like 20%. So I just have to eat all the time. Um, so I'm going to go because I'm starving. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad that you can eat again. I'm very happy about it. And yeah, thank it's you. It's so funny. Whenever, whenever I do all my presentations, like I always forget to mention that. I guess I always think that's implied. And people are always like, oh, wait, can you drink? I'm like, oh, yeah, no, don't worry about it. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. I'm very glad. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you so much for coming thank on. You. This is so wonderful. And enjoy your meal. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 As always, you find the show notes on our website, sustainablelivingpodcast.com, with the links to Amy's website, her TED Talk, and all the other things we talked about. Hope you enjoyed this show, and tune in again next week. Thank you so much for listening. We appreciate you. Thank you.